Father, we praise you this morning because you are always faithful. And what an amazing truth that you are always for us, that that you are with us wherever we go, whatever we're doing, and you are before us, behind us, around us, surrounding us with your love and your mercy and your grace and your truth. And Lord, this morning, some of us uh, know that in the depths of our souls and we're rejoicing and others are trying desperately to to get in touch with you. They're struggling and they're hurting and, and they need to know that you are for them today. God, you're for us when you speak the voice of conviction to our souls. You're for us when you offer encouragement and hope. You're for us when your truth penetrates our lives. And so today, knowing that your way is best, knowing that you desire to bless your children, let us hear your voice And let us open up our hearts and our ears and our minds to hear you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible apps and turn to uh, Colossians chapter 3. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. There's a whole bunch of them in the pews around you. And uh, feel free to use one of those. (laughs) If you use a pew Bible, it's on page 1253. So uh, just thought I'd help you out there. And by the way, if you need a Bible, if you don't have one and you want to read the Word of God, then please take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and let it uh, change your life. We're continuing our series called Impact, where we're looking at the book of Colossians, talking about how God can impact your life and how God can use you to impact the lives of others. And and I know right now that some of you are kind of impacted. You're a little bit tense inside because you read the sermon notes and you saw the wire on his ear. And you know that Pastor Chet is supposed to be preaching right now. And some of you are thinking, did Pastor Chad jump up there by accident? No, I'm here on purpose because I am the warm-up act today. I'm the setup man, and, uh, and, and I'm doing that for two reasons. First of all, let me just talk to you about, uh, you'll understand in a minute why I'm, why I'm introducing the message, okay? Uh, this passage that we're looking at today is one that's uh, controversial. It, it makes some people really uncomfortable that it's even in the Bible because it talks about the relationship between masters and slaves. And it was used, misused, I should say, abused by Christians, you know, more than a century ago, uh, trying to defend slavery in the United States. And passages like this, they, they try to justify an immoral, ungodly thing like slavery. And I just want you to know uh, the reason why it's in there, but I also want you to know that uh, unequivocally, the New Testament, and the Apostle Paul specifically, is against slavery. Galatians 3.28, he says, In Christ there is no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. But Christ makes all of us one. And he says, look, all those man-made barriers, all those things that we use to identify and to separate people are wiped away in Jesus Christ. And so that begs the question, why is Paul writing about relationships between masters and slaves and not just railing against the institution? Well, because the Bible is very practical. It's not just a bunch of ideas. It's very practical. And Paul was writing to Christians in the church of Colossae, and he was trying to give them instruction to how to live for Christ in their setting. In the Roman Empire, one-third of the people who lived under Roman rule were slaves. Because when Rome would go in and conquer a country, they would enslave all the people. Now, they wouldn't just send all of them to the mines and the fields, but they would take the best and the brightest and make them tutors for their children. They would take the doctors and make them work for them. And every child born to slave parents became a slave in the Roman Empire. And so there were three categories of people in Rome. There were Roman citizens, which were the smallest segment of the population. And they had all the privileges. And then there were freedmen, and then there were slaves. So Paul is writing to church, and he says, hey, look, there's this whole category of people that have to live under this, this bondage. They need to know how to do that in the name of Christ. Now, we don't have slavery today, praise God, but we have this thing called work. Sometimes it could feel that way, right? So uh, this is really a passage about work. It's about how we are to live as Christians in the workforce. So as we read this, think about how this translates to work. Uh, Colossians 3.22 says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. 
you are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. The theme today is work. And, and that's why I'm not preaching this message. So you guys need to understand, I, I've grown up uh, and, and I have been in ministry in a local church since I was 19 years of age. I have never had a real job. You know, as I like to say, everybody can't be in ministry. Some people have to work for a living. And, uh, and, and so I can teach you what the Bible says about work. I can share the insights, the truths from God's word, and they are absolutely true. But I know that some of you might be tempted to go, you're a preacher. What do you know about my job? What do you know about the real workforce? What do you know about the secular workplace? It's just a whole different game, and, and you might be tempted to not listen because of that. So I asked Pastor Chet to preach this message. Now, most of you only know Pastor Chet as Pastor Chet Anderson. Uh, I met Chet in 1988 when he was a volunteer in my youth ministry. It's my right-hand man. We worked together. And, and I knew Chet then as a successful life insurance salesman for Liberty National. And, and uh, see, he had a real job. And he worked out in the world, and he applied biblical principles to his job. And he was a successful life insurance salesman. He became a successful district manager for Liberty National. And then after, uh, because he has this problem with work called, you know, being a workaholic, he burned out in life insurance. And then he went on to become a successful retail store manager in men's clothing. In other words, for the first 25 years of his adult life, he had a real job. And so when Calvary started looking for someone to handle our, our money and our, fi our finances and our facilities and, and to bring some uh, godly wisdom from the workplace to be part of our team, I knew Chet to be a man of integrity, a man who understood what uh, the value of a dollar was, a great steward uh, of his own resources and of God's resources. And uh, I knew that he applied biblical principles to his life and to his work. And so we brought Chet on in that capacity, and he grew into Pastor Chet Anderson, executive pastor here at Calvary. So knowing all these things about Chet, I wanted to tell you them about him because if he got up here and told you all that stuff, it'd sound like bragging, now wouldn't it? So I'm going to ask you to listen to him as he opens up God's Word and talks about a Christian work ethic. What does God have to say to me and you as people who have jobs, who want jobs, uh, who used to have jobs, wherever we are in that category. So, Chet, would you come and do your job? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chad. Chad is phenomenal. Thank you for that great introduction. And by the way, Chad, I, I would love to get an interview with that Chet guy because he sounds like somebody I want on my team. I don't know about you guys. He, he really does. You know, sometimes when having conversation with you guys, you ask me a question. What's it like having Chad Garrison as your boss. Just let that resonate with you just a minute. <laughs> to which I've come to the conclusion, Chad Garrison is not my boss. Now, I know that that comes as a shock to you, but he is not my boss. He is my teammate. He is my accountability partner. He is who I choose to be transparent with along with my wife. But my boss is Jesus Christ. I hope that by the time this morning is over, that you will realize that every single one of you in this room work for Jesus. If you are paying attention, if you are watching what the scripture said, you will understand that you work for Jesus. You see, I started my sales career at the tender young age of six. I was selling eggs door to door, 50 cents a dozen. I had a pretty lucrative business because my father supplied all of the supplies and I got to sell the eggs and keep the money. At the age of 10, see, I'm pretty good, huh? Pretty good. At the age of 10, I purchased my first vehicle. I took my earnings, I went to the Western Auto Store in our hometown and I bought a 26 inch purple spider bike. Oh, it was nice. And it cost 48 bucks. And that's in 1970. And some of you are looking and say, 48 bucks? You can't, no, nah, that's a piece of junk, right? I can go to Red Robin for a meal for 48 bucks. Let me tell you something, 48 bucks was my annual income back then, okay? 
So that was a pretty significant investment. Now, you've heard me talk about the dysfunction of my family and some of the things that I learned or didn't learn from my family, but let me give them due credit. I learned a phenomenal work ethic from my mother and my father. Unfortunately, my father was disabled at 41, still the most phenomenal salesman I have ever met in my entire life. I don't believe that sales is totally learned. I think you're gifted in that, and then you can improve on your gift. God gifted me in that ability, and I watched my father sell. I was selling life insurance with my father at the age of 10, 11, and 12. Now, I wasn't legally licensed, so don't tell anybody that. He signed it all, but I got to do the presentations. And to this day, I have a beautiful mother who is 78 years young. She started in the banking business with the Citizens and Southern Bank in Albany, Georgia in 1957. She transferred 30 years ago to the Bank of Edison, and she still goes to work every day as she has since 1957, working, displaying, providing. So I had a model to look at. So if you want to know if I'm a recovering workaholic, I am a grateful follower of Jesus Christ, and I am a recovering workaholic because I was modeled work in my life, productivity in my life. And as a result, Of the fortunate result of having that, I adopted what I call a Jesus work ethic. A Jesus work ethic. See, Paul actually talked about it, and Chad set that up. It's phenomenal being on the team with Chad. Chad set that up wonderfully. Did you notice that Paul actually reminded us not to just work when people are watching as I service, but to work how wholeheartedly and not only when folks are watching. Have you ever been guilty of taking on a project or doing something and you just realized, wow, my heart's just not in it? Actually, the work that that produced was pretty lousy most of the time when our hearts is not in it. Would you agree with that? God challenged us through Paul's direction to work wholeheartedly. And then the other side of that is we somehow have adopted this philosophy in the work arena that when the cat's away, the... You know, it's interesting to me that every one of you knew that just about. Because I believe that Paul didn't mistakenly put that in there. I don't believe that God inspired that by accident. I believe he let us know that we don't work for mankind. We really work for God. Men and women and business owners and businesses fund the ministry that we're in. And some are fortunate enough to be like Chad Garrison started at 19 years old. And God funded his ministry through an organization now called Calvary Baptist Church. Ten years ago, I got to join this organization, this ministry, this mission that funds the ministry that each of us have. Some of your ministries are funded in lots of different ways. I don't know where everyone works in this community. Now, when I just said that, some of you just tuned me out and said, you know what, Chet? I don't work anymore. I don't have to work anymore. Well, if you happen to be one of those wonderful folks that adopted the philosophy to work and you've got resources that you don't have to work outside of the home, remember this. These principles apply to your family life as well. They don't stop just because you're not gainfully employed outside of the household. Now, I believe that there's three basic principles that I'd like to share with you that have helped me to be successful in this business called work. The first that I believe that Jesus' work ethic is to be faithful. In the context of work, being faithful is showing truth and constant support or loyalty. Keeping your promise or doing what you're supposed to do. In other words, if you're supposed to go to work at 8 o'clock, you're not showing up at 5 minutes after, right? You're not just walking in the door at 8 o'clock. You're going to work at 8 o'clock. Because why? Because that's what you're supposed to do. And by the way, if you're showing up late, that's a form of theft. I'm just going to bring it to your attention. Now, you don't like for me to say that. and You have all sorts of excuses as to why. But honestly, if they're paying you to work from 8 to 5, work from 8 to 5. If they give you a break, take it. 
But if you're supposed to be there, be loyal to the person who's signing your paycheck, who's funding your ministry. Because here's the deal. Every single one of us have a ministry in a ministry area that we serve in. Believe it or not, you may be the most Christian, the most loving, the most caring, the most committed follower of Jesus Christ somebody else knows, and they're watching you, and they're watching what you do, and they're watching the decisions that you make. And you may not ever know that they're watching you, but they are. And most of the time, they have this little check sheet, if they're like me, and they check it off. Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, you show up late for work. Oh, you've been taking staples home. Oh, you don't take out the trash when you're supposed to. Oh, what kind of a reflection is that, right? So be faithful when you go to work. Now, secondly, be honest. That translates this way. Not, tr- not, not lying, not stealing, and not cheating. This is the principle that really shows up real character, especially to the world. And by the way, character is one of the core values at Calvary. We believe that you cannot represent Jesus Christ unless you reflect his character. The character of Jesus Christ. Now, when you look in a mirror, what do you see? A reflection most of the time, don't you? This is interactive, by the way. Do I need to come out here? (laughs) What do you see when you look in the mirror? You see a reflection, don't you? You see a reflection of who you are. Now, here's what I'm finding out. Any of you ever look in the mirror and see something other than what's in the mirror, what you really want to be, what you really hope to be? And I remember as a kid, I don't even know that you guys even remember who Tony Atlas was, but he was standing there and he had flex that he was doing. I'm like, yeah, I'm standing in front of the mirror and I'm doing all this. Well, I was seeing my body looking like that, you know? but it wasn't an accurate reflection of who I was. And when we talk about character, do the people that you work with know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ without you saying a word because you have chosen to represent the character that Jesus Christ is in your life? Are you that reflection at work because you're choosing to be faithful and you're choosing to be honest? Being honest means that you're choosing, making a choice to tell the truth. When you're asked a question. Now, I was gifted to be able to be in sales. I love sales and I love people. And here's what I was told. Tell them whatever you have to tell them to what? To make the seller sell them. But you missed one key word. Fortunately, I worked for an organization that had some ethics, had some backbone, had some morality. And this was the key word that was in there. Tell them whatever it is that you need to tell them as long as it's the truth to sell them. I don't believe there's ever a reason why a salesperson should lie to a client. Ever. Never. If someone has a need, you point out a solution and give them the choice to meet that need as far as the solution is concerned. But you are choosing to do the ethical thing, the moral thing, because you're a follower of Jesus Christ, not just because it's the right thing to do. Remember, you're that reflection of Jesus for those folks. Now, we practice putting together sermons, and and we go over them on Wednesday mornings. We've got several hours that set aside. And of, of course, because I don't get the podium every week. That's not my strongest suit is not being on the podium, but I love to connect with Calvary family from here. And as a result of us going over it, Chad was doing the introduction. Now it takes me about a month to put together the sermons. It's not just one of those things, oh, I get to preach this week and boom, there it is. And God has just really inspired. It's one of those things that I've spent a lot of time putting it together, praying, putting it down, modifying it, changing it, listening to God. And when I heard Chad's introduction of me, when he said, you know, in 1988, we met, you were moral, you were ethical, you were applying those principles, that kind of hit something in my heart that just didn't sit well with me. And what that was is there was something in my background, believe it or not, that I had totally forgotten about until God used Chad's conversation to bring it to my attention. Now, remember I said I started my sales career when I was six? 
And I was one of those brilliant salespersons. I mean, I was brilliant. At age 18, here's how brilliant I was. I was living in a house that my clothes were being washed and folded and put away by my mother. She was cooking my meals every day. I had to pay zero rent. The only thing that I had to do was mow the grass and keep my room clean. And I was so brilliant that I wanted to start out on my own career that I left all of that good stuff. Because I'm so brilliant, right? And as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, you don't make choices always that honor yourself, your family, or God. Sometimes we look back and we remember things. We don't want to, but we remember things that we said, whoo, I wish I hadn't have done that. Well, this conversation came around and something was pulling at my heart and I remembered something. At the age of 20, I joined a sales team at Ivy Stockman Supply. It was a young man that gave me an opportunity to work for him. Large animal, biologicals and pharmaceuticals, Powder River cattle handling equipment, salary and tech. And boy, I loved it. I loved every bit of it. We also adopted an FRM feed store. Man, that was wonderful. I loved every part of that. But here's the deal. Because I was 20 years old and moved out on my own and been on my own for a couple of years, and I was one of those ones that went to church and was thought of to be pretty ethical, the owner of that company trusted me with his business, handed me keys to open and close that business. And I can honestly tell you that every decision that I made was not honoring to God, nor was it honoring to that business owner. And when we were going over this, the name the face and the instances started coming back to mind. So guess what Chet got to do? After direction from God, Chet got to pick up the phone and locate where this gentleman was. And he had moved from Albany and he was down in Oakland, Florida now. Retired. And I got to have a conversation. And not only did I get to have a conversation and saying, hey, I didn't always do the most ethical thing. Sometimes I made deals that benefited me and not your business, and I want to apologize because I was stealing from you. I want to apologize for that. And not only do I want to apologize, God has given me a certain amount that I need to send you in a check, and I'm sending this as a check to you. Now, what he chooses to do with that check is up to him and God. I was obedient to what God told me to do as a result of hearing from God. Now, let me just go ahead and throw it out there to you. If you've been guilty of lying and cheating and stealing, and when I started telling this story, you were going, ooh, dude, I remember some things that I've done. Don't just go marching out of here and run up to the person and just unload on them. (laughs) Because you might wind up in jail. (laughs) We've got a ministry to the jail folks, and we'll see you. (laughs) However... What I am going to challenge you to do is have a conversation with God. Say, God, you know what I did. You know what my intent was. Because sometimes we as employees justify that we're worth more, and we take it upon ourselves to provide for ourselves out of the till. And, and, and according to statistics and retail stores, the number one loss process from a retail store is from employees because they're trying to justify their existence and justify what they have or own or do. And if you've been guilty of that, you ask God, God, who is it that I need to talk to? It may be 28 years later, but if it's 28 years later, you pick up the phone. Some of you are not even 28 years old. So if you've been doing it, call them. Make it right, whatever it is that God tells you to do. Now, he's going to feel uncomfortable, and the reason why I say that is because here's what I found out from God. We all sin, and we're sinners. And we can look back at it and say, well, you were a stupid 20-year-old, and I'm still a stupid 54-year-old at times, right? (laughs) But this is what I know. If I confess my sins, God is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Well, see, the issue wasn't between me and God because I'd already confessed that to him, and I was clean where that's concerned. The issue was between me and the owner of that business. And so when I chose to do what James says, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed, that's when the real healing started. And I got to tell you, it's freeing to know that Satan can't hold that lie over Chet Anderson any longer. Amen? So that's part of being honest. That's part of being, having an integrity. It's part of having a work ethic. When God brings it to your mind, 
do what you need to do to get it right through daddy's direction. Through daddy's direction. Thirdly, work with excellence. Work with excellence. By excellence, I mean extremely high quality. Notice I said extremely high quality, not perfection. Any perfectionist in here? Well, let me give you the test real quick. You may want to join those who just handed their hand up, put their hand up. If you had a list of 100 things to do and you did 98, 99 of them almost to perfection, absolutely great, and you looked at that list of 100, but you couldn't see the 98 or the 99 that you did, the only thing you could see is that one that you didn't do right. Do you obsess over that one? And if you're one of the ones that said, yeah, I probably am that one that's going to obsess over that one, guess what? You're part of that perfectionist crowd. And here's a trap that perfectionists fall into. We want to do it perfect, and if we can't do it perfect, our self-worth goes down the drain. We're useless. That's a lie from Satan. We are on a journey as followers of Jesus Christ to become the reflection, not Every bit of it was given at one time. Become that reflection of Jesus Christ. And as we follow Jesus Christ and as we grow, he molds us, he shapes us, he makes us into that image. Makes us into that image. And as we grow and as we desire to present ourselves with excellence before God, do the best of your ability, not someone else's ability. I believe that that's excellent. I used to ask my oldest son, he'd ask me, he said, Dad, I didn't get such a good grade. Now, not such a good grade to him would be a 94 or 95. To me, I'm like, score, right? But to him, it wasn't a 100. Therefore, I said, did you do the best that you could possibly do with what you had? If he said yes, I said, then you did the best. That's excellent. That's perfect, son. But he couldn't hear that sometimes. And some of us are sitting in this room, and we can't hear that either. All we look at is that one mistake that we continue to make, and that makes us imperfect. Can I just encourage you to confess that to God and realize that it's not your job to be perfect. That's God's job to create a perfectness in us. It's our job to surrender as he is moving us to that perfection in him. Now, that doesn't give us an excuse to keep sinning. It doesn't give us an excuse to slack off. It doesn't give us an excuse not to do the best of our ability. And in this way, I personally have high expectations for myself, and I have high expectations of my teammates. So I try to be careful not to expect more than someone else's ability. Because, you see, in my quest for excellence, Chad alluded to it, I found myself working for the plaques and the trophies and the accompany awards for being the high achiever. Man, I love those little trophies and those little plaques. Matter of fact, I had a whole wall full of them in the house that I used to own. We walked between, look at how good I am. Boy, my chest had come out. Guess where those plaques and trophies are now? In a box in the garage. You're right. And you see, I put so much emphasis on getting a plaque. I wanted to hear, well done, good and faithful employee. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to hear, well done, good and faithful employee. But if I was so obsessed with hearing, well done, good and faithful employee, that my focus got off of being well done, my good and faithful servant of Jesus Christ, my priorities were out of order and can be out of order. And this is when I really found out that they were out of order. When that I had four children in three different schools, and I couldn't tell you one of the teacher's names that my children's class, my children's class, I knew I was in trouble. The other thing that I knew I was in trouble is I started spiraling down and fell into what we call depression. Now, you've heard me talk about my insane period, and for, for sure, for about three years, I was totally insane. But I've actually got paperwork that says I'm sane now, do you? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, don't judge me because I got the paper. <laughs> but as a result of that, I fell totally apart because 
All of my self-worth was built around me being able to produce for someone else instead of me being what Jesus Christ created me to be and use the giftedness. Now, I've found out what it's like. The last 10 years have been the most phenomenal 10 years in my entire life. And I have found out what it's like to be in a place where you can use your giftedness and you can use your talents to do exactly what it is that God created you to do and to be. And that's to lead people to life change. How do we do that? We say it every day by loving on people. If you haven't figured it out by now, I invade your space because I love you. you I'm there. I love you. And by sharing the truth of God's word, just like we're doing this morning. It's not Chet's word. It's the truth of God's word that changes our lives. And so some of us in this room may have adopted that philosophy of being workaholics. And if you are, try to repent of that. And if you don't know whether you are or not, every service that I've had thus far, I've asked the mates or the friends to tell the person that they're with whether they are or not. And it's amazing how many hands didn't go up, but how many spouses said, yes, you still are. (laughs) If you're in that way, please repent of that. Because if you continue on that path, you are dangerously close to doing what the scripture calls idolatry, being idolatrous. That means my focus is more on myself than on my relationship with God. And that's a dangerous place to be. If you want to really look and know what being idolatrous is all about, read any of the Old Testaments when the prophet said, repent, put those idols away or I'm going to destroy you. Satan tried for three years to destroy me. Now, I was a follower of Jesus Christ. He tried to destroy Chet, but he couldn't because I was God's child. And God did not allow that to happen. God redeemed my life. But hear this, 14 years later, I still have the scars. 14 years later, I still get to redeem in situations just like I did this past week. I still get to redeem family situations because I chose to be disobedient. I chose to be overwhelmed by the world and my focus was out of order. And that quest for excellence, that quest for excellence. Now, as we look at this, You, every one of us, have a mission field that we talked about. Everywhere we go is our mission field. First and foremost, I believe it's your home, and that's your family. That's your mission field that God has entrusted you with. Secondly, if you have a job outside of the home, your teammates are your mission field. That's the teammates. And if you don't have either of those and you're a student or you're growing up or you've already retired, which, by the way, we're going to talk about that retirement thing here in just a minute. If you've done that, those who you hang out with, those who you're friends with, those that you recreate with, that's your mission field. You get the opportunity to be the reflection of Jesus Christ in their lives. Because I got to tell you, honestly, I have found out that faithfulness, and honesty and excellent in work, excellence in work has produced good returns for Chet and his family. But now you say, okay, Chet, well, that's great. That's, that's what I should do. But yeah, you just don't know my boss. You, you have no idea this guy that I work for. Remember, who do we work for? Do you really work for Christ? And if you do work for Jesus Christ, remember, he is the ultimate boss. He's just allowing someone to have authority over you right now to fund your ministry. And if you start looking at it that way, it'll change your whole attitude about going to work. But the owners are those of us who are responsible for the lives of others are not off the hook here. Take your Bibles, if you still have them open. Look at chapter 4. Look at verse 1, what it says. Chad read this. Masters or employers treat your bondservants or your employees how? Justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master who is in heaven. Ultimately, our boss, our master, who we answer to is Jesus Christ who is in heaven. And Paul issues a challenge to every employer We are to treat those that we have influence or authority over with R-E-S-P-C-T, as the sister said, respect. Respect, respect, respect. Now, I don't know about you, but I got to tell you, one way that you display respect 
is by being generous. Being generous. Wow. One of the ways that communicates to me that I am valued by my employer is if that employer is generous to me. And you may have the opportunity to bless some folks' lives by being generous. And what that means is this. We are to provide more than the amount that is needed or normal. Is there anything about following Jesus that's normal? I haven't found a whole lot of it. So we provide more than the amount that is needed or normal. Sharing in the profits, sharing in those of things that are of value to those that are creating that wealth for you as an employer. Share it with them. In other words, apply the golden rule. Now, I'm not talking about the modern day golden rule. He who has the gold rules. I know you've heard that, right? So what's the real golden rule? Matthew 7, 12, ESV says it this way. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. That's the golden rule. What do you want your employer to do? You want your employer to treat you the same way that you treat him, right? As an employee, you want to treat them the same way, not justifying that they may be this cheapskate just because they can, just because they own the business. Don't fall into that trap because then you may fall into the temptations that I did. And then you get to repent. And then you get to come up and tell thousands of people how stupid you really were. <laughs> but God forgives and redeems. Praise the Lord. He does. So don't be a tightwad or cheapskate just because you can. Exercise generosity as a testimony to the generosity that our Heavenly Father gave to each one of us. How generous was God with us? In that while, Chet Anderson, that while every one of you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. John 3, 16, which if you don't know any verse, you probably know that. For God so loved the world that he did what? Gave. I believe that that's generosity. When you say giving, gave his one and only son. He didn't have two dozen, 10,000. He had one and only son, and he gave that son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's generosity. That's an opportunity for us to serve. That's an opportunity for us to be generous. As followers of Christ. Secondly, I believe that employers are to be fair. And it says it in here. Be fair and just. Treat people in a way that does not favor some over others. Now I want to clarify here. You're going to treat employees different based on their ability, their productivity, and their intellect. That's a good business practice. But don't treat employees different because of their particular interests that they may have. Let me give you an example. That same business that I worked in, we had manufacturer's reps that would come down and they would take everybody in the business that played golf to go play golf. And guess who didn't play golf? And so me being the one that wanted to be included in, I went and purchased a set of golf clubs, K28 Wilsons. And I know you can go ahead and tell me they're not real golf clubs. I understand that. All of the golfers that pulled me aside say, Chet, don't tell anybody else that you bought K28 Wilson golf clubs. <laughs> But I bought K-28 Wilson Golf Clubs. Why? Because I wanted to go. And I wanted to be treated like everybody else. And I was being treated differently because my interests were different. As an employer, do not treat your employees that way based on their interest. Include them in. Don't make differentiation because their interests are different than yours. I'm pretty sure every one of you in here are not college football fans. I am. I happen to be married to a wonderful woman who loves college football. I am a blessed man, okay? But if you're not a college football fan, I'm not going to treat you differently or look down on you. That's what it's saying. And then thirdly, I think one of the most important things that employers can do is by equipping, equipping their employees. And you can do the same in your family. By all means, equip your employees to do the job you hired them to do. Take the time to invest in people. Is it easy to invest in people? Do this with me if you can shake your head and it doesn't give me. It's not easy to invest in people, is it? We have a philosophy at Calvary. People are more important than process. Did you hear what I just said? People are more important than process. Do you really believe that? 
Do you guys believe that people are more important than process? Most of you will say, yes, I believe that, Chet. Then why is it that we find ourselves caught up in the fact that process becomes more important than the people? We're standing there on the phone and you got three customers waiting there and you're talking maybe to your girlfriend or your guy friend and talking and you got customers that are waiting in line. Treat them with respect. Give them the attention that they deserve. Equip your employees. Now, here's what I mean by equip. Give them the tools that they need to do what it is that you're asking them to do. Don't have an unrealistic expectation of them. You see, I had an unrealistic expectation. I believe that because I can sell, I think every one of you ought to be able to sell. And I think I ought to be able to tell you how you can sell. You ask 10 people, can you have an interview? On average, four of them nationally will give you an interview. And out of those four, one will buy. That's a proven fact over and over and over again. If you've ever been in the sales business or you're still in the sales business, you know what I just said is true. It's simple, right? But that's not true for everybody. So as we look at this equipping, communicate what it is that you want from your employee. Let them know what it is that you expect out of them. Because here's what I'm finding out. In the 38 years of working experience, I am totally convinced that when employees know what's expected of them and you treat your employees with generosity and fairness, me too, darling, and take the time to equip them, they'll have a happier You will have a happier, more productive, more ethical, more moral employee, and the productivity will go up. Now, here's a really catch-22 question. What's the greatest asset as a business owner that you have? Your employees. And would all of us agree with that? Okay. So let me break it down on a family level. What's the most important asset that you as a father or a mother have if God's blessed you? It's your family. Whatever that looks like, moms, dads, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, those that live. If you're an employer, your employees is in that area. If you're a friend, your friends in those same areas. And as we're rounding the curve, headed home, make sure that you treat those that you're associated with, family or business, fairly, okay, with generosity. And make sure by all means that you equip them and communicate your expectations. And finally, I've searched the scripture. And I'm not the resident theologian. Chad Garrison is the resident theologian. But him and I have had a little bit of discussion in this. Nowhere in God's word can I find where God says to quit, to stop. And some of us want to say retire. So let me address that retire thing I told you I was going to address. And some of you are looking and saying, man, that's so far away. I don't even want to talk about it. Retire. If God has provided resources for you to fund your ministry without you having a job each day, phenomenal. At no point in time does God ever say you have the opportunity to quit serving me. Do you realize that that carries on past this earth and into all of eternity? We get the privilege of serving the Holy Father through all eternity. We can't stop. We will not quit. And so here's a kind of enlightening word for you. Your retirement party that some of you are looking and stretching and wanting for, is going to be your funeral. Your retirement party is going to be your funeral. Why? Some of you don't want to talk about death, but it's a reality because you take a step from this side into eternity with the Father. Why? Because we work for Jesus. We work for Jesus. Will you join me in prayer? Father, thanks for loving us. Thanks that you give us an opportunity to work Thanks that you give us the ability to think. Father, most of all, thanks that you give us the resources that we need to fund ministry. Whatever that looks like for every individual in this room, God, we praise you for it. And my prayer is that through your Holy Spirit, we'll apply these principles. And we will take these principles outside of these four walls. And we will turn Lake Havasu City in this area upside down. Because we're choosing to apply your principles in our business in our work ethic, and in our homes. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to work.